coming up in chapter two of My Name is Sheba. It was 10 o'clock at Dizzy's and no Berg. Colette was beside herself. She didn't let on to Des, the manager, that she was concerned, but she'd been in the ladies' room freaking out. At 10.10, Des came over, asked if everything was okay, and said, we gotta be making noise by 10.20. Colette, now claustrophobic, went to stand outside. She was worried about way more than the set. Her mind was racing. What's gonna happen now? I'm so scared. I need to talk to Mama so bad. Is Berg okay? Did he leave me? As Berg raced to the venue in the cab, he knew more than ever that Cole and the baby were his whole world. Nothing else mattered. He'd do anything for them now, and he'd be there for her, for them, no matter what. Even after this bender, he had more clarity now than he'd had in the last three months. How could I be so insensitive, so selfish, so stupid, he thought. He then prayed, as one prays when that which they love the most is at stake. From Subplay Creative, I'm Monroe Jones, and this is My Name is Sheba, the coming-of-age saga of iconic jazz R&B artist Sheba Hawkins. It's her rise from obscurity as an orphan to superstardom and the music she created along the way. My Name is Sheba is written around the original music from the album of the same name by singer-songwriter Candace Springs. Chapter 2 Berg and Colette would wait until halfway through the second trimester to tell friends and family about the baby. The pregnancy would be easy to conceal since they rarely saw either one. And the winter months in Manhattan allowed for loose layers, bulky sweaters, and heavy coats. We just gotta make it through Christmas, thought Colette. That'll buy us time to figure it out. There was never any question about whether or not they'd end up together or wanted children. It's just that the way in which it all went down had taken them both by surprise. In their minds, they were still kids. There was so much to navigate. They knew that both families, once they'd gotten over the shock, would be overjoyed. Berg's family loved Cole, and Cole's mom, the only family member on her side that mattered, adored Berg. But initially, there would be hard, uncomfortable conversations. Questions they didn't have answers for. Berg especially dreaded the talk with his dad. He wanted to prove he could make it on this path. He didn't want to appear foolish. And now, so much, not to mention his pride, was at stake. Scenarios of the heated exchange played out in his head, to the point where he had to maintain conscious control of his thoughts to not be overwhelmed. While they longed for the light moments, Berg and Colette knew they'd now turned a corner, leaving those days far behind. We're all in now, they'd say to each other. In the blink of an eye, they'd taken on the weightiness of adulthood but the heaviness of uncertainty occasionally gave way to glimpses of hopeful expectation as Colette, who'd been so ill throughout the first trimester, began to take on the glowing countenance of a mother-to-be. Their love for one another was real now. A relationship once built around a shared affinity or common interest was now based on something, someone, way more substantial. Burgundy and Blue continued to play at Dizzy's, as well as other clubs in the area, and their small but loyal group of fans followed them wherever the duo made an appearance, except for private gigs Berg and Cole had taken on just to pay the bills. Things like bar mitzvahs and birthday parties. Nothing was beneath them. It's true Berg had gotten his law degree, but up to now, he'd purposefully not taken the bar. It was his way of burning the ships. He knew that if he'd gotten his license, he'd never pursue the music. In light of the current situation, though, that was a luxury he could no longer afford. He had to rethink his strategy now that there was so much more at stake. If he could still file and burn the candle at both ends over the next few weeks, working during the day and studying at night after gigs, he might be able to cram and just be ready for the bar exam by the deadline. He knew it was a stretch, but well worth it if there was a slim chance he could get in and pass. 
Also, Berg hoped that by checking that box, he might save face with his dad when they had the talk. It was hard for Berg to recount his impulsive decisions in recent months without beating himself up. If he dwelled on it, he'd go dark and the critical voice would chime in. That dream of chasing the Hawkins gift, that's more a curse than a blessing. But even now, in the midst of so much uncertainty, those brief, amazing moments when they were on stage, they felt like a refuge. And though it was just for a minute, the world stopped when Berg was playing and Cole was behind the mic. They were in a safe place, secure and in control, transcending their troubles. They were surrounded by love. They were home. Cole marveled that their baby had a front row seat for every show. She and Berg often joked, our baby's gonna be steeped in music. As the weeks passed, Berg studied and they both worked every chance they got and tried hard to be resourceful. So far, they'd managed to keep their secrets safe. But now on the other side of Christmas, the time they'd bought to make a plan was running out. Once hopeful, the stress of always being one unexpected event away from disaster was starting to take its toll. Some cracks were beginning to show. Berg tried to keep it from Colette, but he was having panic attacks, shortness of breath, pounding heart, sense of impending doom, the whole package. He wanted so badly to be strong that he was afraid to let anyone know. And the longer he kept the secret, the larger the monster grew. The walls were closing in. Colette could sense that something was up. She knew Berg's default reaction to stress. He shut down. Not in a functional way, but relationally. He became quiet and closed off. Not the Berg she knew. When this would happen, she felt like she was all alone in her circumstances and her thoughts would run wild. What about another mouth to feed? What about healthcare? Aren't we gonna get married? Aren't we a team? Aren't we all in? What if something happens to one of us? <sighs> Colette needed to know she wasn't alone. One Friday morning in late March, when Colette was just under five months along, three of Berg's best NYU buddies who graduated with him the previous spring called out to say they were in town for an event and wanted to take him out for a beer. Great, Berg thought. Free night out with the guys. We'll hang and I can press pause on reality just for a second. He checked in with Colette. Hey, Cole, Jacob, Bo, and Wes are in town for some seminar happening in the morning. They want to take me out for a beer. Said they want to treat the starving artist, said Berg. Oh, really? Do they know they're two starving artists, soon to be three? Cole said, attempting to be playful. No response. Berg just looked at her. Is this something you want to do, said Colette, hiding hurt feelings. Yeah, I think so, Berg said in his now usual mopey tone. Well, go. Have fun. Just be back for the 10 o'clock set at Dizzy's. She'd grown concerned. But honestly, exchanges like this aggravated her. The last couple of weeks had been peak stressors. Berg was on autopilot. Maybe seeing the guys is just what he needs, she thought. That afternoon, they swung by in a cab around four to pick Berg up. He buzzed them in. When he opened the door, he hardly recognized them. These guys, his once comfortable, casual compadres, Brothers in Arms had, in less than a year, morphed into filled-out men in suits. Who are these guys, Berg thought. Without skipping a beat, he said, Can I, can I help you? They looked at him. Berg, still the cool, dark, hungry hipster. And they got the joke. First stop was happy hour at Chumley's. On the surface, things seemed normal enough. They kicked around college memories for the first 45 minutes or so. But as they caught up on what they're doing now, Berg felt like he was sitting with strangers, eavesdropping on a conversation in a foreign language, happening at another table. Two beers in, Berg shut down, but his buddies were full on. I bought Apple a buck a share, said Wes. Dude, no way, Apple sucks. They won't last. My broker got me Circuit City and they had a two for one split in June. Electronics are the future, countered Bo. Jacob jumped in. You guys are both going down. Commodities are the way to go. I'm telling you, it's energy. I bought Enron. Berg, what are you buying? No response. Berg, what are you buying? Berg looked up. 
Uh, yeah, I have a Jack and Coke. At this point, Berg was inside his head. You're a loser, said the critical voice. By 7 p.m., Berg was officially shit-faced, wallowing in self-pity, and the conversation moved on without him. By 8 o'clock at the Village Tavern, the topic was sports. By 9 o'clock at Down the Hatch, it was girls. Berg was just a ghost at the table. He hated his circumstances, hated the struggle, and unlike them, he'd been true to his heart. Am I being punished for that, he wondered. He still wouldn't trade places with any of them. And yet, he was a loner, a misunderstood anomaly to his friends and the world. Fuck. He couldn't say it. Part of him still believed. Screw the Hawkins gift, he mumbled. The three just looked at him. Then Bo said, let's go eat. At the Taco Bell on Varick Street, Berg was now drowning his sorrows in two burrito supremes and a beefy tostada. Then, in a moment of clarity, the kind that only comes when you're too inebriated to enunciate, but in the perfect headspace for self-reflection, it hit him. Wait, he thought, what am I doing? I've got what they want. They want the family. They want to end up where I am right now. That's where they hope to be. And I'm about to piss it all away. Holy shit, what time is it? Berg asked. Berg asked Jacob to lend him cab fare, and he ran out the door. It was 10 o'clock at Dizzy's, and no Berg. Colette was beside herself. She didn't let on to Daz, the manager, that she was concerned, but she'd been in the ladies' room freaking out. At 10.10, Daz came over, asked if everything was okay, and said, we gotta be making noise by 10.20. Colette, now claustrophobic, went to stand outside. She was worried about way more than the set. Her mind was racing. What's gonna happen now? I'm so scared. I need to talk to Mama so bad. Is Berg okay? Did he leave me? As Berg raced to the venue in the cab, he knew more than ever that Cole and the baby were his whole world. Nothing else mattered. He'd do anything for them now, and he'd be there for her, for them, no matter what. Even after this bender, he had more clarity now than he'd had in the last three months. How could I be so insensitive, so selfish, so stupid, he thought. He then prayed, as one prays when that which they love the most is at stake. At 10.15, the cab pulled up right in front. Berg saw Colette standing there. She had tears streaming down her face. His heart sank. He jumped out and ran to her. Baby, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. She saw the concern on Berg's face, and in that instant, she knew there had been a shift. She was afraid to trust what she was sensing, feeling, because it was hopeful. Colette's worry, now mixed with anger and guarded relief, she said, you stink. Look, Cole, Berg said emotionally, I gotta say this, I can't explain it. I've been so confused. I'm scared and I've been freaking out, but it's because I love you so much and I don't wanna screw it all up. The guys tonight, they made me realize my whole world is you. I've got what they're after. I'm so sorry I haven't been there for you. I see it all now. It'll never happen again, baby. I promise. I love you so much. Please forgive me. That's all I want now. Please forgive me. I promise. I'm all in. Colette could feel the tension leave her shoulders as they hugged. She relaxed in his arms. They were the words she so needed to hear. Colette felt like she still needed to say it though. Berg, I need you to be here, to be present with me, with us. I know, baby, I know. I'm here now, he said. They looked silently into each other's eyes for a long period of time. Okay, come on, we got a show to do. That night was their most inspired performance ever. The house was packed, and the late start only heightened the crowd's anticipation of what, who, they'd come to see. Maybe things were tough at home and in the men's room. At one point, Berg had to go lose his burrito supreme. But on stage, Burgundy and Blue were at the peak of their powers. After what was typically their set closer, rain falling, Berg asked, Hey, 
Y'all mind if we try out one more we've been working on before we all go home? The crowd roared with approval. Unbeknownst to Colette, he'd put music to one of the lyrics she would often leave on top of their out-of-tune spinet piano in the apartment. He scratched it out earlier in the week, and he tucked it into Colette's bag, just in case. As Cole was looking at Berg, wondering, where is this going? He reached down into her bag, on the floor, pulled it out, and handed it to her. She saw the title, and her eyes welled up. Colette just looked at Berg and shook her head slightly as if to say, of course. Berg played through the intro once, paused, and Colette gently covered his right hand on the keys with a look that said, I need you to go one more time while I regain my composure. And then, fully in control, in character, and focused on the music, she starts. If love is all you have, it's all you need. If love is all you give, then you'll receive love in return. All the love you have earned, maybe we'll learn to be what we can be. If love is all you give, it's all you get. As gentle as a soft plain minuet Love has no price There's no compromise One day we'll open up our eyes To see what we can see A summer breeze A summer breeze An August moon This chapter of My Name is Sheba was written, recorded, and produced by me, Monroe Jones. Original song, Love is All We Have, comes from the album My Name is Sheba by Candace Springs and can be found at Spotify, Apple, or wherever you stream music. Other original music in this episode is by Jason Donnelly, Humans Win, and Tincture Music, all of whom have royalty-free music available at Storyblocks. 
That's storyblocks.com. For more behind the scenes info on the creators of the story and the music, visit mynameisshiba.com. And if you like what you're hearing, please follow, leave a rating, and tell a friend. My Name is Sheba is a product of Subplay Creative. 